Hello there, shavelings. Before we get started on Sunday morning at 9 a.m., you can look at me at a thing called Kaiju Masterclass, where I will be talking about my days with Tsuburaya Productions and Godzilla and Ultraman and all of that stuff. If you're into that sort of thing, please join. It's a free online convention. Starts on Friday night, goes to Saturday and Sunday, and I'm on it Sunday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time, noon in uh, the East Coast. Also, on Saturday, the day before that, we are having our all-day Zazen, which is not really all day. It starts from 10 and goes till 2 in the afternoon or 2.30. It depends on how we feel. Uh, everybody's invited to join that. You can come for as long as you want and whatever you want. Uh, also, free to join. We do ask for a donation, but if you can't make a donation, that's fine. Groovy, please join anyway. I was spending the last couple of days reading, I sound like a German immigrant when I say, I was spending the last three days what, reading Kobenchino Roshi's commentary on the Heart Sutra. And it is an amazing piece of work, and that's what I intend to talk about on Saturday. So we'll see how that goes. And uh, what else? Oh, also ACZC, uh, angelcitiesandcenter.org, for information on all of our sittings, which are all available online nowadays. And we're going to keep making them available online for as long as people want to keep uh, joining them online. So there you go. No excuse for going, well, I want to be Brad's student. Well, <laughs> that's how you can do it. <laughs> Just join in. Never has been easier before in the history of anything. So somebody had asked me to talk about koans in Soto Zen, and I thought I'd try to do that. For those of you who don't know what a koan is, normally it's explained as being a, an illogical story which is intended to free the brain from logic. And it's practiced in Zen where you're given one of these stories, usually in the form of a question, what is the sound of one hand clapping, anything like that, and you are invited to answer the question to your teacher. There's a, a certain set period where you go and you prostrate in front of your teacher and you say, uh, my name is and my practice is, and you tell the teacher your koan and then you're supposed to kind of give a response to the koan and the teacher tells you if, if it's good enough response or not. Ziggy is going nutty. He's just running around like a maniac over there. Anyway, that is the usual understanding of what a koan is. And if you've read the books of D.T. Suzuki, you'll see a lot of koans in there. If you've read uh, Philip Kaplow's books, there's a lot of koans in there. But as to its role in Soto style Zen, here is what Dogen has to say about this idea that koans are illogical stories. The understandings of these shavelings is inferior even to that of shravakas of the small vehicle. They are more stupid than non-Buddhists. They are not lay people, they are not monks, they are not human beings, and they are not gods. They are more stupid than animals learning the Buddha's truth. What the shavelings call stories beyond rational understanding are beyond rational understanding only to them. The Buddhist ancestors are not like that. Even though rational ways are not rationally understood by those shavelings, we should not fail to learn in practice the Buddhist ancestors' ways of rational understanding. Pretty strong stuff there from Master Dogen. So Dogen did not like the idea of practicing these koans as a, a, something you're supposed to answer to your teacher or regarding them as irrational stories that are supposed to send us beyond rationality. That was not his idea at all, and that's not the way he taught it. There is this weird tendency among certain schools of Zen in the United States today to try to shove that back into Dogen, like, like to try to say, no, Dogen really did that practice, but there is zero evidence of it. And if anybody out there finds some evidence and can present it to me, I would love to see it. But every time that Dogen gives his instructions on how to do zazen, he instructs shikantaza zazen. He doesn't instruct holding a koan in your mind during zazen and answering it to your teacher. Now, that being said, there is a tendency of some people to hear that and think that Soto style Zen has nothing at all to do with koans, and that's not true either. This uh, is my teacher's translation with Mike Letchford and Jeremy Pearson of 
Dogen's, Master Dogen's 301 koan stories, Shinji Shobo Genzo. And it's a big, thick book full of koan stories. And these are stories that uh, Dogen collected while he was traveling in, in China mostly, and probably elsewhere. And he is supposed to have written this book in one massive all-nighter that uh, happened just before he got on a ship to go back to Japan. I don't know how much to believe that story. That seems a little, a little hard to believe. But the idea is he, he collected all these koans and copied down the ones he liked and, and uh, took them back with him to Japan, which is, that's probably true. I don't, I don't think he did it all in one night, though. <laughs> but he took them back, and the koans in Shinji Shobo Genzo form the basis of a lot of the chapters of Shobo Genzo. Maybe even most of them. I'd have to go do a survey to see if it's actually more <laughs> than not. But the typical way that Dogen works with a koan is that he first presents the story to his readers or his audience. A lot of the things that we find in Shobo Genzo are transcripts or at least the drafts of uh, speeches he gave. So he presents them to his listeners or readers and then comments on them. And sometimes the commentary can get very difficult and, and hard to understand and strange and, and weird and wonderful sometimes too, but that is how he works with them. And that's generally how people in the Soto school of Zen work with koans. They're usually presented publicly uh, as things to discuss. Now, as for the idea that they are stories beyond rationality, well, it is quite easy to think of them as stories beyond rationality because some of them are, are quite strange. Here's one. I just opened the book at random to see if I could find a nice strange one for you. And, and right here, I happen to open to page 69. <laughs> Hello, Bill and Ted. And it's koan number 49, and it says... Master Tozan Yokai asked a monk, where have you come from? The monk said, I came here after enjoying traveling in the mountains. The master said, have you arrived at the top of the mountain? The monk said, yes, I have. The master said, is there anyone on the top of the mountain? The monk said, there is no one. The master said, then you haven't arrived at the top of the mountain. The monk said, if I have not reached the top, how can I recognize that there is no one there? The master said, Reverend monk, why don't you stay here in this temple? The monk said, it is not that I refuse to stay in your temple, but there is a person in India who does not affirm my staying here. The master said, I suspect that this monk is excellent. So that sounds pretty weird, right? So let me just read you cold without, I mean, I read this uh, years ago, but I don't remember what it said. So I'm going to do a cold reading here of what Nishijima Roshi comments on this and, and this is how he works with them. When asked where he had come from, the monk said that he had been enjoying traveling in the mountains. This suggests an attitude different from the usual Buddhist monk. He seemed rather relaxed and not trying to get something. So the master asked him if he had arrived at the top of the mountain, if he had attained the truth or not. The monk replied that he had. Master Tozan decided to test the monk and asked him if there was anyone on the top of the mountain, whether his state of truth was the non-discriminative or non-intellectual state where we do not divide reality into parts. When the monk said there was no one at the top, the master could not feel anything in the monk's reply to suggest that he had attained the truth. The monk insisted, saying that he could only know that there was no one there after he had arrived at the top. In other words, although we attain the truth as a person, the state of truth itself is the state prior to dividing reality into parts. The master realized that the monk had attained the truth and asked him to stay at the temple. The monk replied that he had no objection to staying in the temple, but there was someone in India who did not affirm the decision to stay there. The person in India means Gautama Buddha. Thus the monk was saying that his state was the same as Gautama Buddha's and that his Buddhist intuition was telling him that he should not stay in this temple. So that's the way Nishijima Roshi worked with koan. I think that's a perfect example of how he did it and how it's done in the standard form of of Soto Zen is just to kind of talk it through. And in fact, Nishijima Roshi is probably better than most in terms of just making it really, really straightforward without trying to 
you know, hornswoggle you with <laughs> with some weird things. There is another translation. Uh, I'll probably get in trouble if, from some people for saying this, but there is another translation of Shinji Shobo Genzo out there, done by Kazuaki Tanahashi and John Daido Lori, and the translations of the koans themselves by Tanahashi sensei is uh, perfectly nice but then they add the comments by John Daido Lori which which to my mind forgive me John Daido Lori up in Buddha heaven wherever you are for saying so but the the his way of working of the koans just makes no sense at all to me i can't follow a word he's saying uh, in in his comments on the koans and it's because he's trying to do this rinzai style where he's just sort of baffling you with stuff and trying to trying to confuse you and one-up you uh, nishiji maroshi didn't like that style of working with koans one time when i was talking with him about it just one to one he said the student likes to be defeated by the teacher and that was his summation of the whole process that the the student enjoys going in there and being defeated by the teacher and and you know and then you f have this weird relationship where you know you've got master and disciple and it's an uneven relationship where you know it's always and forever the master telling the disciple and, and it fosters a kind of dependency and stuff and Nishi Maroshi did not feel that that was a good way to work with koans for whatever you want to think about that. Another thing that Nishiji Maroshi would say about koans was that they were not irrational or illogical. He said that they were demonstrations of Buddhist logic. So his insistence was that there was a logic to the koans, but it wasn't the standard sort of logic that we are used to. And he would probably have told you that it's based on the four philosophies, which he would say are idealism, materialism, action, and reality. And maybe I should do a whole other video about that, but his idea was that the koans present to you a story which, this one I just gave is probably not a great example of that, but they're often a story which presents you with first an idealistic point of view, then next a materialistic point of view, and then a point of view that takes in action in which the material world and the ideal world are, are fused together as one. And that's the fourth view, reality itself, and that is how you understand the koans. Like I said, the one I just read to you is probably not a great textbook example of that. The best example of that I know of is, uh, I think it's the second paragraph, first or second paragraph of Genjo Koan. Anyway, it's, it's a real good example, and I talk about it in my book, uh, Don't Be a Jerk, and probably some other books, uh, how that works. And so if you want to go look that up, you can look that up, and that'll be fine. And uh, if you want to also look me up, no, don't look me up. If you want to send me money, you can send me money at the address you're seeing on the screen below, or if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see direct links to my PayPal and Pay patreon accounts and that is how i make most of my living these days that's one of the reasons why i'm making so many darn videos uh these days um, it really helps out when you donate that that has made all the difference in the world uh, for me staying alive <laughs> uh recently so i thank you very much for that and having said that if you are having financial trouble yourself you don't have to donate to me uh, i'll manage and i will manage because there are lots of nice people out there who are continuing to donate, and I really appreciate that. And if you want to see me on Saturday and Sunday, uh, I've already told you where to go if you want to see me on the computers. So thank you very much. Maybe we'll see you there. Have a good time all the time. Bye.